Okay. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Well, before we open today's webinar, let me briefly ask you something. If I ask you to come up with the names of young people who are changing the world today, would you need much time to think? Probably Greta Thunberg comes to your mind, or Sanna Marine, youngest female state leader, or Amanda Gorman, the youngest inaugural poet in US history. And I'm sure we can go farther with a long list of young and bright minds. But would you come with many names if I ask you to think of young people in politics among top decision makers? I'm afraid this would be just a bit more difficult exercise, perhaps. So here I come with some numbers that I've gathered for you today. In 2019, one third of the EU population was under 30. Yet the same year, the European Parliament, which represents these people, had only 29 members under 30. Only 4%, this is just under 4% of more than 700 MAPs. Well, having this gap in mind, it could not be more timely to discuss today how to empower the next generation of European leaders. Let me welcome you all at this virtual seminar hosted by Center of European Policy Studies, CEPS, in partnership with International Youth Think Tank. My name is Tina Tin Ahladiani. Well, call me briefly Tina. I'm a researcher and the coordinator of Young Thinkers Initiative at CEPS, and I will be moderating this session for the next hour and 15 minutes. So we will start with an inspiring keynote speech, which will highlight the challenges that will shape the future of the EU, for which we will all bear consequences, particularly young people. Given the importance of these future challenges, we will then launch the call, CEPS Young Thinkers Initiative, which we believe creates opportunities for youth to shape their own future. Well, of course, we will set an example today of putting young voices at center stage. We will have four youth fellows joining us today who will share with us their proposals on how to address the biggest challenges that the EU faces today. And this is not the end. Well, we will bring the youth fellows together with the high level panel, high level EU policymakers who will put these proposals of youth fellows into perspective. And they will share with us why it is important to engage with youth. I very much encourage all of you to raise your questions throughout the webinar in Q&A section of Zoom, so not in chat, Q&A section of the Zoom. And together with my colleagues, I will be collecting these questions throughout the whole session and we will address them towards the end of the webinar. Well, we have a quite uh, busy agenda I had and I have an agreement with speakers that I will be strict with timing and I will let them know when their time is up. With this, let me invite our keynote speaker, Heather Gravy. Heather is the director of Open Society European Policy Institute, famously ranked by Politico among the women who shape Brussels. For the next 10 minutes, we will learn from Heather about the challenges that will shape the future of the EU. Heather, many thanks for being with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tina. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm delighted to see this very interesting report um, and this initiative. And I'm really glad that Open Society Foundations is supporting initiatives to bring young voices and ambitious proposals from young thinkers into an EU debate that's sometimes looking rather old and tired. So this, this energy and also the practical ideas are really needed at this moment in, in history. Um, I don't even need to start telling you about all of the challenges that are facing Europe today. And I think that the title of this conference, Back to the Future, is really about refocusing the debate and the policy making on the longer term challenges that Europe and the world face and not getting too distracted by the short term issues. It's very easy during lockdown and with a whole series of political crises and dramas over vaccines and recovery funds and so on sometimes to lose sight of what we'll be facing in 2025, in 2030, and definitely in 2050. So I just wanted to give you a context to start with um, of what are the challenges that will shape the future EU because the world doesn't wait for Europe to get its act together. And it doesn't also wait um, for uh, immediate resolutions to the immediate problems. There are longer term things going on that we also need to think about. And of course, we'll hear later on about uh, some of those challenges in the report presented um, 
shortly. Uh, the proposals on how to tackle disinformation, protect the democratic debate, reform education, foster participation, promote equality. And there's a key role of youth in all of these issues, um, particularly drawing attention to the challenges that will face young people today throughout their lives. Um, as you know, democratic politics is unfortunately based on four or maximum five year electoral cycles. So politicians tend to think towards the horizon of the next election. Businesses, even worse, are often thinking just about the next quarterly profits or at the most the next annual meeting. But actually, we need to be thinking about future generations. We need to be thinking about the challenges that will be faced by a baby born this year, 2021, one who's born in 2030, one who's born in 2050, because these people will be entering a world um, that is riven with challenges very soon. And we need to think about intergenerational fairness in many of these issues, not simply um, the voters of today who and the politicians of today who make decisions. We've, we've got to think longer term. So I want to just present briefly three big issues that I see shaping Europe's future. I regret to say that the Conference on, on the Future of Europe, the official um, EU process that's going this year may not really address these, um, but I think it will inevitably uh, be looking at issues that are provoked by them. So climate change is the first one, and the impact of the European Green Deal. The second one is, of course, the effects of digital transformation. And the third one is the erosion of democracy and rule of law within the EU itself as well. And um, I know that Daniel Freunton and Kotlin Cher, who will be speaking later, have been very active on all three of these issues in the European Parliament and making a very positive contribution um, to longer term thinking about these issues. So first of all, on climate action. So in a way, I see the political elites in Europe are, have become a little bit complacent, actually, about climate change. There was a huge push before the European Parliament elections in 2019, thanks to Greta Thunberg, but also um, the other activists like here in Belgium, where I live, Anuna de Wever, Adeline Charlier, Charlier. There are many people now involved. And it's also global. Um, there, are, there are activists in youth activists in many countries who really pushed this issue to the top of the political agenda. But now there's a bit of a sense among politicians that, ah, oh, well, we can see there are really high levels of support for climate action, which there are, it's above 90% across um, the EU. But what they haven't thought about is what will happen when the practical measures that the European Green Deal under Vice, Executive Vice President Timmermans will be rolling out, how that will affect people's daily lives and how people will react to them. So we've done work at the Open Society European Policy Institute on public perceptions of climate change and what people are prepared to support in terms of changes in their own lives and also what they're prepared to support is collective action through voting and through policies. We worked with a, a great German think tank, Depart, and um, the, the research group um, a Counterpoint um, on these, and I can put in the chat um, links to the two reports. But just to give you the headlines, the good news is that overall people are aware of climate change. There's very little climate denialism in Europe, unlike in the US, and they want climate action. But they underestimate quite significantly the degree to which humans actually are causing human climate change and they're underestimating the severity of its impact, including on their own lives, let alone the lives of their children, grandchildren and great grandchildren. The good news from this report uh, in terms of support is that the under 25 year olds get it. Younger voters are much more willing to support radical action, including electing parties based on their green commitments. But the over 25s, and that's really unfortunately across the, pop, the, the rest of the age range, still don't really understand what measures will be most effective in terms of tackling climate. For example, they, they think that it's about more recycling, more better waste management, which is true, but they don't get how much of a contribution to um, biodiversity loss, uh, damaging non-sustainable use of resources and, and emissions is actually caused by much more major changes that need to be made to energy systems, mobility, um, and of course, food production. So these issues are still not there um, in people's minds. But that's why the under 25s are so important. That's the activism that can persuade older and more skeptical voters that the transition to zero carbon has to happen much faster in order to safeguard guard the lives, not just the lifestyles, but the lives of future generations. Um, so I think that this is the key thing that needs to happen also to prevent a populist backlash um, in Europe as the implications of the European Green Deal become more apparent. I'm really worried about what you can see from the Alternative for Deutschland in Germany, the Sweden Democrats, um, 
and a number of other populist parties who are turning from migration as their main um, focus of grievance and, and way of driving a wedge in society to climate measures instead. And that's where I think that um, it's really vital that youth activists keep raising the issue, keep pushing the fact that you've got to think longer term. It's not just about short term recovery from COVID. Now, the second issue is, of course, digital transformation. We can't have a conference without mentioning it. But I'd just like to draw your attention to a couple of things that, that aren't discussed so much in the public debate, but are important for the long term. This is not just about abuses of individual rights, but it's also the way that disinformation and echo chambers really threaten the foundations of democracy. This is something that the report you'll hear about shortly uh, points out very well. Because digital, the online experience and digital life changes the way people engage in the public sphere and their, expect, their expectations of politics. So they think that politics can deliver things super fast, fast as an Amazon delivery or an Uber service. Um, they also expect things to be highly interactive, um, engaging with them as an individual. And political parties are not very well set up to do that at the moment. They also expect to see a lot more um, availability of information and of opportunities for debate online. And again, political parties are not necessarily well set up for that. They've got a lot better. Uh, 10 years ago, it was only the populist parties that were really active on social media. But there's still a tendency of mainstream parties to broadcast messages through social media, just put out their press releases rather than engaging with people. And I think that would be a very interesting issue to discuss with the elected representatives of political parties we have with us today. But it's also really vital to, uh, to not just the supply side of politics, but the demand side of politics, i.e. what voters ask for and what they want to engage with and to develop their resilience against disinformation and anti-democratic uh, tendencies by having really strong critical thinking skills. This again is something that's in the report and that's a vital thing that the Open Society Foundations have supported for a very long time. I just quote to you Karl Popper, um, who was the author of The Open Society and Its Enemies, which was the inspiration for the organization I work for. And his view was um, an open society is one in which nobody has a monopoly on the truth. So the idea that critical thinking, each individual thinking for themselves and having their own truth is really vital to debate. And that is the fundamental end underpinning of an open society. But that's really difficult to have when there's so much conflicting information now available. And when the digital sphere has changed politics to being something that is uh, much less top down, which is a good thing, but where bottom up engagement is increasingly frustrating for generations who are used to a very fast and interactive online experience. And that's something that needs to be addressed as well. And then I won't even start on the, the role of, of platforms, but we could go into that. I just want to finish by talking briefly about other threats to the erosion of democracy and the rule of law. We can see a decline in the quality of democracy across Europe over the last decade. And I, I regret to say the EU was initially very reluctant to engage in the protection of democratic standards and the rule of law within its own boundaries, because these are issues that were always taken for granted. It was assumed that these are things that domestic politicians would sort out when you become an EU member state, you'll be a democracy forever. There's no possibility of going of going backwards, that you could regress on democratic standards. This is sadly not the case, as becomes more and more evident. Um, and the threats um, to democracy are reaching the level to affect also the functioning of the EU's legal order. And I'm, both Daniel Freund and Kathleen Chair have been very active on this. I'm sure we'll be able to say more about it. Um, but I would just like to highlight to you that it's really important to connect the somewhat technical democratic response at EU level to these threats, um, which is necessary. It's important to do infringement proceedings, to, um, to tell governments that uh, what they're doing is not acceptable in terms of EU law. But it's also really important to connect that with mobilization for democracy, to again, to increase the demand side of democracy, not just the supply side, not just the institutions that guarantee democracy, but also the expectations of voters that ultimately shape um, how far politicians can go in exercising their mandate and doing their job. Now, there's been a, a lot of mobilization for democracy. It's harder to do it in lockdown, obviously, but I think that um, it's a key moment when to move beyond street mobilization 
radicalization into a broader push for democratic renewal, particularly from um, the younger people who have just become voters, who are about to become voters, or who've been through maybe a couple of electoral cycles, that they can, they can find new ways of engaging in politics um, through activism, but also through deliberative democracy, through slow democracy, as it's called. There's the fast activism, but also the slow democracy of having citizens' assemblies and an interactive engagement for the co-creation of policy. These are really exciting new um, areas for democratic renewal and innovation in Europe. So I'm glad to say, uh, just to, to finish, um, the Conference on the Future of Europe um, would do well to look more closely at these issues, but there's only so much it will be able to do. It's going to be very short um, and uh, focused on, on some issues that are less controversial, but it could yet be useful if it starts a conversation on the institutions and policies we need to protect our public goods in the 21st century when we're faced with the combination of a massive systems change to a sustainable economy. We're also faced with a digital society, which is very different from the one that, that representative democracy was set up for. And when we're faced um, with uh, the erosion of democratic norms and rule of law within the EU itself. So I wish you a really great debate. I'm looking forward to what everybody has to say about this, um, but I, I think your energy, your activism, um, and this kind of report are really essential parts of uh, European democracy as it stands today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. I'm always impressed how much you can really tell us within a very short period of time. It's a lot of food for thought, so green and digital transformation, erosion of democracy, and these are the topics that I'm sure our youth fellows will very much closely relate later on. But before I invite youth fellows, let me first, uh, well, let us first learn what we have been doing at SAPS to basically create more space for young people to speak up and to get engaged in the EU, EU policy debates. So let me invite my colleague, Isabel Watson, who is a membership and communications officer and a member of Young Thinkers Working Group at SAPS. Izzy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tina. Uh, yeah, so we're very excited to announce that um, SEPS Young Thinkers is a new initiative that SEPS is launching. Uh, so the aim is to bring younger and more diverse voices into European policy debates. Uh, it's part of a wider initiative called SEPS Sustainable Diversity Goals, actually funded by the Open Society Foundation. So we're looking for around 30 students to form our Young Thinkers Network, who will take part in a series of activities throughout the year. Uh, the goal is to provide a platform um, where we can encourage debate on issues currently affecting Europe and the rest of the world, and also connect young people with policymakers and those who are currently making decisions. So the primary activity will take place at Ideas Lab, which is SEP's uh, flagship conference, and this year taking pl place virtually from the 31st of May to the 4th of June. Um, so for those who don't know, um, Ideas Lab is a big conference where we gather policymakers, NGOs, other think tanks, uh, government officials and businesses to discuss the key policy issues that are happening this year. Uh, so at the conference, we'll run a parallel programme uh, for young thinkers during the week. And we'd like to hear young thinkers thoughts on the theme of the future of European democracy and the role of citizens in the EU. So the group will take part in um, a two to three hour sessions every morning uh, in a ver variety of activities. Uh, there'll be strategic for foresight sessions run by the Fraunhofer Institute uh, and also um, the grid unit at SEPS. Uh, and these will help guide the discussions around the themes and collect everyone's thoughts uh, that can then lead into policy recommendations. There'll also be the chance to test a new uh, mobile app which is part of the Trigger project, which is a project that SEPS is working on at the moment. Uh, and this will also help um, the young people to talk through the feasibility of different options, um, collect everyone's thoughts, and also help you to understand where other people's opinions might be coming from. Uh, then by the end of the week, there'll be lots of support in putting together the different recommendations that you have. And there'll be the chance to present these uh, in a high level round table um, with um, some different policy makers and will also be streamed as part of Ideas Lab. Uh, so I guess who can apply is a good question. So it's aimed at students, so if you're an undergraduate currently studying or master's student, PhD students, or if you graduated in 2020 onwards, then we welcome you to apply. Um, it really doesn't matter what subject you're studying, so we'd really like to have a big range of people applying. 
the main thing is that you're interested in the future of Europe and also shaping the future of Europe. Um, one thing I guess that might affect whether you can take part or not is that the sessions will mostly be taking part in the morning um, for uh, Central European time. So that's the only thing, but we welcome big range of people to apply and we want diverse perspectives um, and non-Europeans also. I think that's everything for now. Happy to answer any questions at the end. Well, many thanks, Izzy. We really tried at SAFS to be creative for a very creative generation, to offer a lot to uh, for them to give the space to express their thoughts. Many thanks, Izzy. So we put indeed a lot of work in this uh, initiative and I think even more enthusiasm than work. So we're very much looking forward to receiving the applications from young people who are passionate and who are ready to shape the future of um, Europe. But also we are here today not alone. Uh, well, while launching these exciting initiatives, we decided not to be alone. Uh, well, there is a saying, if you want to go uh, fast, you go alone. If you want to go farther, you go together. And this is the approach SAPS has taken. So we are today here um, partnering up with International Youth Think Tank. And I'm very excited to introduce you to Urban Standberg, who is the director and co-founder and uh, manager of the International Think Tank, International Youth think tank IYTT and Urban just please do let us know what has been uh, IYTT doing and um, we're very much looking forward to meet um, the four fellows afterwards. Thank you Tina for, for introducing uh, this. This is a gorgeous event we have today. I'm so happy to have you all on board in this uh, important issue. So the IYTT was founded in uh, the late fall of 2018 by Cecilia Manson and myself and what we are trying to do is well, we are trying to promote the democracy movement among uh, young Europeans. We define young as being between 18 and 24. And the core activity is annual conferences that we organize. You could maybe call them workshops instead, because the, 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 the thing about them is that we invite young people to really come up with tangible proposals, not only to come to listen to people. That is one way to organize ways of bringing youth together with, with powerful people. We invite them to come up with tangible proposals. So we have had two conferences, one in 2019 and one in 2020. And I'm ha happy to say that the first one, we had 199 applications from uh, young people in 31 countries. And, and last year we had 218 applications and uh, from 38 countries and, and selected conference attendants. And, uh, you will meet uh, four of them here today from, from the last year's conference. You actually did a conference through Zoom because of Corona, but even though it was hard for them not to meet one another, which they had hoped for, they still produced the very high, high caliber of, of results as the first year's conference did. I will now share a, a view with you that is uh, telling on how we are uh, working in the y IYTT uh, with the conferences, but also how we uh, stick along with the youth. So it, follow me through this. Uh, at the bottom, uh, half past uh, six, you will see the, the red dot, the annual international youth conferences, the four day conference with uh, up to 30 youth carefully selected. So they came, they come to the conference and we are saying, we will structure your uh, discussions through moderating. We will invite very interesting people powerful decision makers, uh, scholars, and other people who will be your commentators. You are not here to listen, you are here to work, and we will moderate the discussion. And after, uh, and follow me clockwise now, so what comes out of the, of the conference is policy proposals. And they are presented to an open audience with decision makers, scholars, and other important people in the preliminary research, uh, preliminary conference report, sorry. And then a couple of months later, and this is where we are today, there is a final conference report, which is presented to an open audience, which we have here today, which we soon will we'll see the example of. So two, I mean, the first step in this, which we call the IYTT policy advice loop, the young people take the initiative, but they present their proposals to powerful people in a dialogue. Then we pick out some of the proposals and ask a researcher, to do a research overview, to get some knowledge. What is, the, what, is the, what is the background? What is the possibility of really pushing the proposals that the young people are proposing? And that is done, this research overview in the dialogue with the young people. Eventually it flows out as a working paper. And with this working paper in mind, I'm asking the, the youth fellows 
because we are calling those lovely people who have gone through the conference and who want to be stay on in the think tank to be youth fellows. So the youth fellows, they then produce a policy brief. That is to say, they take into consideration what has been coming up in the working paper by the scholar and rethink their original proposal and redraft it in a way, in a crisp way, which we know powerful people will listen to. And after that, we ask the IYTT European Youth Panel, and that panel is people who originally applied to the conference but didn't make it because we selected only a few, but they and they are now 130 people from 28 countries, and they are coming in with their thoughts to broaden and, 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 and embed our proposal even more. And then we organize lo lo local study circles with uh, people uh, and with students and we, with whoever who wanna discuss the proposal and the study circles are moderated by the youth fellows. So I think that is a very important way of bringing out the depth of views on democracy from from whoever living in, in, in different settings all over Europe. And eventually there will be a policy brief which will be presented to policymakers and to democracy networks. And in this case, this year, we will pre present our two first policy briefs in the Almadolen Democracy Summit, which will be running on July 7th. So this is how we are thinking about bringing young people together with powerful people and ask the young people to come up with tangible proposals, but do that by listening to decision makers, scholars, other European young people, and with people they find in the everyday life. So this is the IYTT, and I will stop talking because I think the proof is in the pudding, and the pudding is just now about to come when the youth fellows of the IYC 2020 will present the final report. Thank you. Many thanks, Urban, and indeed, let's not waste any time and then let's invite our youth fellows, Miriam Wallstrom, Elena Beck, Yasin Benyakoub, Joshua Bloodworth, who came here today to present their proposals on how to address the biggest challenges that you faces today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, Welcome to the International Youth Think Tank presentation. It's an honor for us to share with you the final product of the International Youth Conference of November 2020, in which we focused on ways to empower people in challenging times. For society to master the many challenges ahead, like COVID and the climate crisis, we need strong and supportive governance at a global level. That is why we call for the United Nations to truly step into the 21st century and serve the global governance for real. The UN came to exist after an unspeakable crisis of World War II. Now it needs to push for a similar shift in the global society. The current pandemic has revealed the inequalities and lack of cooperation that exists between the UN members. The UN has appeared to be ineffective in answering that key issue. That is why we propose the UN 2.0, a concept of radical reforms to the institution. The steps we recognize as necessary are real regional representation, meaning the inclusion of more Asian, African, and Latin American countries in the Security Council. Real voting power, meaning an end of veto. Real application of the agreements to the member countries, meaning more binding agreements and more enforcement of such. This will ensure that the global crisis will see fair global discussions and effective solutions. In the face of so many challenges, citizens have a right to secure information and media, because now the status quo is a truth crisis, unreliable facts spreading at a grand scale. To secure a balance of free speech and trustworthy media, we call for the Global Charter for Truth. The UN and other international organizations need to enforce a new set of rules and guidelines to fill the law-free space of new media and digital enterprises. The Charter will include a truth check on information, making the companies accountable for their content on their platforms. Immunity for the journalists, providing them with a similar status to the diplomats in order to combat the political and governmental influence on independent media. International support for journalists, creating a global support network of intergovernmental organizations for journalists and whistleblowers. And lastly, clarification on the data ownership issue. 
free apps are not free. You pay with your data. The Charter will push towards more transparency and decommodification of users by tech companies. Citizens need to have safe access to true, reliable information through the media. We also want to stress the importance of education and the effect that this has on every democratic aspect of our life. One example of this is presented in the graph, namely the people with the higher education vote in both EP and national elections to a way higher degree than people with a lower education degree. We want to acknowledge that it should not require a college degree to understand how we as citizens can influence our society. To empower people from all ages to build a European identity, we have formulated some recommendations. Our suggestion is to reshape the educational system. As there are a lot of pe young people and adults who lack critical thinking and knowledge on the EU, we would like to include more inter interactive teaching methods that equip students not only with theoretical knowledge, but also develop their soft skills, like the four C's, namely critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication. These methods would be based on discussion, problem-based learning, independent research, and would also include political workshops, especially before relevant political events like a national election, etc. With this, we hope to equip every citizen with a toolkit that increases their knowledge, awareness, and participation in political events and topics and lay the base for a lifelong learning. Another solution is the program Education Plus, which could be a complement to Erasmus Plus and Erasmus without paper, and provide students with the opportunity for an international exchange in a digital form. Students from diverse countries would discuss different topics together during a time slot specifically designated for this. To facilitate the program, the exchange would take place at the school premises and they would be equipped with the necessary technology. Also, a special digital platform would be developed. The digital exchange could be complemented by a physical one, which could be funded by the EU and would take place after both classes have built a connection over a long period of time. This initiative would be beneficial for diverse individuals to build a Euro European identity and feel included. Finally, we want to emphasize the relevance of our solution once more by stating that education is not a privilege, it's a fundamental human right, as defined by the EU Charter of Fundamental Human Rights. Connecting to our educational suggestion, we believe that not only bridging the knowledge gap will empower people, but also encourage political participation. We know that there is a lack of empowerment for people from underrepresented groups, such as um, you know, people from different ethnicities, classes, sexual orientations, genders, abilities. Um, it is not enough to say that you have a right to exist. There has to be clear interventions in your favor. And because of that, we designed a twofold proposal. On one hand, we have developed a proposition for training for political participation. Limited knowledge and capacity can be addressed through a mentorship program that pairs a local politician with a young person from an underrepresented group. In the long run, we expect that this would improve political representation while having an immediate local impact. Our second proposition is a strategic program that targets high ranking and powerful position within the public sector that aims to, on a symbolic level, combat self-censorship at all level of the recruitment by assuring that at the very top, people from underrepresented backgrounds are leading the institution. And more pragmatically, this objectively improves the quality of the recruitment since folks from all walks of life uh, undergo less biases through the recruitment process. Equality and by extension inequality are broad topics that underpin the issues we've been discussing today and the problems that face our democracy. Firstly, we believe we need to address the unequal access to opportunities for minorities through legal and social means. Whilst the notion of legal equality is not new, we are reiterating the importance of the enforcement of a fundamental global minimum standard. We are all global citizens. 
cultural change must be hastened through the use of social and economic incentives with the reasons for this and the next steps outlined in our final report. By increasing representation and access for minority groups, we will build towards establishing a stakeholder society in which marginalized communities are empowered to voice their opinions. It's also important to support left behind communities often existing as a result of intergenerational inequality, whether that due to be structural dependency from colonization or other forms of long standing privilege. It's important that these communities see that democratic institutions are looking out for people like them so they do not lose faith in these institutions. We suggest three proposals. In the age of the climate crisis, we believe it is essential that new measures of economic success are used. It's far past the time for GDP growth to be replaced with an array of indicators that focus on optimizing human well-being and the environment as integral parts of our economy. Second, we propose a universal based income to ensure everyone has a minimum standard of living, ideally funded by a wealth tax, therefore making it redistributional in design. This will help those in left behind communities gain new freedoms, expanding autonomy within their own lives. And finally, we believe in the empowerment of workers by introducing, introducing more democratic practices within corporate structures. By providing ordinary workers more power and influence, they'll be able to play a more significant role in a corporate decision making, having greater influence over their own circumstances and that of the working class communities they are part of. We believe this could lead to a holistic economic policy that highlights shortfalls in our economy, increased economic freedoms for those who have the least, and fair redistribution of wealth and power within our economy in favour of the less advantaged, given those left behind communities, making them feel like they're remembered. Finally, I want to say thank you for listening to our proposals. While some people may say they seem idealistic, we believe that they are rather in the vision of optimistic realism. The ideas and structures of today with a factual basis and having great ambition for what is possible. If you'd like any additional details on the proposals from the presentation, please feel, feel free to read our final report. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you for presenting these big things. You really brought big things, I think, at the table. A lot to discuss and, uh, well, I'm sure only high-level panel could address such interesting and ambitious proposals. So uh, to make sure that youth fellows would get today the most reasonable feedback, uh, we brought on board very experienced new policymaker, Cecilia Malmström, who has served as EU Commissioner for Trade and previously for Home Affairs. She's also been MEP and Cecilia also has been Swedish Minister for European Af Affairs. We can go farther. I'll stop here. But uh, I'm sure she could be the person who would definitely be able to put those proposals into perspective. Well, together with Cecilia, we also have very young and very inspiring MAPs, Kathleen Che and uh, Daniel Freund. So Kathleen is Vice President of the Renew Europe and the European Parliament. She's known for her activism and feminism and speaks supporter of both human rights, women's rights, democracy. And um, Daniel Freund is also a very big supporter for more citizen engagement. And Daniel has been recently elected by the Green Group in the European Parliament to lead the work on the conference uh, on, the on the future of Europe. So many thanks to all of our panelists to be with us today, despite their very busy agendas. And let me just start by one question I would have to every panelist. And let me start with, uh, with Cecilia. Well, I, I've just uh, noted here down some big things proposed by uh, by the youth fellows. So UN 2.0, uh, an end to veto, more enforcement, uh, reforming multilateral organizations and how the system works. Well, um, I would ask whether it's necessary. Well, I'm sure it's necessary as young voices say it's necessary, but um, maybe I should ask you, how do you see the feasibility of this? What could be the challenges these things to actually materialize? Cecilia, floor is yours. Thank you, Tina, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for this uh, initiative, the Young Thinkers Initiative of SEPS, and thank you to the youth fellows for presenting a super interesting report. It's impossible to comment on everything, but I'll make a, a few ones and then my co-panelists uh, will, will follow up. Definitely, we have seen the erosion of um, uh, many well democratic thinking, but also of, uh, of the multilateral system. The multilateral system that was constructed after the Second World War was very much a response to the atrocities of the war, of course, and uh, a response to cooperation between the US, Europe uh, and others. And although those institutions that were built at that time 
were not perfect, they have worked rather well. But we have seen, and it's not only the fault of President Trump, even if that sort of escalated during his mandate, the erosion of this. So there's urgent need to reform G7, G20, WTO, WHO, and of course, the United Nations. The United Nations have, as you said, been remarkably absent during the COVID crisis uh, as well. So there's every need in the world to reform it on a broad basis. But coming to your proposals, I very much agree with that. The structure of the vetoes made sense at the beginning. It was a way to, to engage with the big powers, the sort of uh, after the Second World War and in order for it to function. But today it is leading very much to, to one of the inertias of the system. So it should be uh, abolished. That is easy to say, but very hard to do, of course, because you would need to have unanimity to get away from the unanimity. Uh, but, but it is a, a reform that should be pushed, and it should be pushed by, by also the members of the Security Council and the permanent members, uh, which should be broadened, exactly as you say. It is almost a scandal that there is no African country uh, permanent member, or that there's so little representation from Asia and none from uh, Latin America. So this should definitely be broadened. And I think, by the way, that the EU should have one common seat at the Security Council. Uh, this is probably easier to achieve than getting rid of the veto. So starting there is probably a better first step and then trying to get uh, rid of, of the veto. But, but the reforms that you propose are absolutely, um, I fully share um, the, the, your, your engagement in this. The enforcement of United Nations conventions is of course a source for sorrow many ways, because the United Nation is a cooperation between independent states. Some of them are democratic, some are pure dictatorships, others are authoritarian at the best. So it is very hard to do enforcement. The United Nation doesn't have a police, it doesn't have, it has a few courts. They function so-so. Uh, so this will, will of course be, be very hard. Um, a reinforced sort of name and shame procedure could be one first step. Uh, but this, we've also seen that, for instance, the Council of Human Rights contains members who are the most sinners of human rights in that particular body. So it is, it is really difficult. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not sure how exactly that enforcement would go about, but it is definitely a, um, a, a good proposal. And then we should work. Maybe you could start with the Coalition of the Willing. Uh, those who, who, who want to do this, and then building and broadening to engage with other countries uh, as, as well. If there is a momentum for multilateral cooperation, and I'm, I'm naive or optimistic enough to think that there is, even if it won't be easy, that of course has to broaden also to a lot of post-COVID cooperation. Climate is one thing, others will talk about that. Strengthening of democracy, I hope we'll come back to that. But also um, the, one of the, the big results is a, a, an increase of uh, economic inequalities that you mentioned within countries, but also between. Not only the pandemic, but the pandemic has reinforced those tendencies. So I see with a little optimism, some um, efforts to put some order in that system on a multilateral level. The efforts of uh, taxing uh, the, the Digital companies, for instance, is a quite advanced exercise with 140 countries under the umbrella of OECD, but much broader. And I think there is a push from outside and inside to get to something and also will be a minimum tax uh, level there by the summer, by the autumn. The US have sent some very positive signals there. Also, there should be a broadening of the, that you do not propose, but within the same kind of thinking, uh, some sort of global uh, carbon tax. The EU is preparing a proposal of border adjustment tax. It has different names. That is all well, but in order for it to be really functional for the environment and not only a way to collect money would be to make it global. And there also, I think the same format under the OECD could be a, a way forward there, engaging China, US, Australia, uh, even Russia, and, and all the others uh, between. Uh, the several developing countries uh, should be in, in, in that uh, as well. And also building on the, the international conventions that are there on corporate responsibility, corporates taking larger responsibility, not only for the environment, but also for decent labor conditions that you mentioned. Uh, this is something that is being discussed 
podcast. And I think it's the right moment with you and others pushing to take that uh, even further. Thank you the, so much, Cecilia. Yeah, uh, uh, sorry. Just winding up that there's so much to say on this. I'll stop there, but thank you for, for the work that you're doing and I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Thank you so much, Cecilia. This is a great point. I'm sure youth fellows really appreciate this feedback and additional points, which I also noted down for myself. They're very interesting. And uh, let us just go to um, another panelist uh, with perhaps a different question so that we make sure we cover all the main points of the report. Let me ask Kathleen to share her remarks on uh, the proposed um, proposals of youth fellows on the good education, good media, global charter for truth. Uh, all inter intercultural exchange. Um, just Kathleen, share with us, what are your thoughts on that? What do you see happening? What do you see not happening? And what are the reasons why you would see not happening those uh, proposed um, policy changes? Thank you very much, Tina. Sorry. Uh, can you hear me well? We hear you, we hear you well, all is good. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, we can start the digitalization process with fixing proper internet in the European Parliament building. Uh, so uh, thank you very much really for having me. It, it's such a pleasure to be on this panel. And uh, as I was also a youth activist before I, I got involved in, in politics, it's uh, extremely good uh, to exchange with you and be inspired by you. Uh, and, and I'm always so glad when young people come forward with ambitious proposals, which, which really give us a job for politicians to act and to do something. And it, it's very exciting to be at the other side because before I was the one who told others to act and do something and time is now. And now like I'm in the institutional struggle to try to make that work. And I always need some you know, push. So it's so good to see uh, these kind of documents. However, I would not say that uh, these are extremely um, unrealistically ambitious proposals. On the other hand, I think uh, many of uh, the points that were raised are very, very good and realistic uh, answers to the biggest struggles we uh, also discuss in Parliament day by day. And as uh, Tina asked me to talk about the media and education part, um, I, 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 I just want to highlight the, the importance of this because Young people uh, today find it sometimes very hard to, to imagine that things can also go backwards, that uh, we are not on the direct path of development and we don't have a direct image of uh, times when uh, we had to you know, fear about direct censorship or when we were persecuted uh, for our opinions or uh, when uh, just only a certain way of thinking was taught in school, because that was something we saw in history books. And as a Hungarian who was born in democracy, uh, but saw democracy progressing backwards in my lifetime, I always say how important it is to really be aware and protect our values and uh, the democracy while we still can, because things can turn around super fast. And the, why, why am I bringing it up here? Because I really believe that the foundations of democracy is, is uh, information and education and knowledge, informed consent. Uh, that is true about what we read in the papers, uh, what happens to our data, what we learn in school. And no wonder why the one of the first tools of dictators and authoritarians is to suppress the freedom of media, is to uh, imprison journalists, uh, take over education systems, something that unfortunately I saw in my own country in the European Union. So, uh, there was one of the proposals I really liked. It's about the protection of journalists and the special immunity uh, the international community should, should give them. I think it's extremely important. However, uh, and then I also, I don't feel it's um, something impossible to do, but, but the real problem, what Cecilia uh, also mentioned, is with enforcement. Uh, because we have a lot of charters and documents and uh, treaties, uh, what we all signed, and suddenly some countries uh, just end up not obeying them or even leaving them, just like Turkey has left the Istanbul Convention. So I think the real responsibility for us decision makers is not only to have a charter in place, but to enforce those values uh, that uh, we find there. And Cecilia mentioned the risks, of course, for uh, UN level action, and I do agree with her. 
However, I think as Europeans, we first have to take care of uh, our own community. And I think the EU can and should do much more in the regards of freedoms, in the regards of media, in the regards of education, also within our community and with the powers we have. And I know that I'm running out of time. Uh, sorry, I can't talk very long, uh, but let me just summarize some things I would like to propose here. So we are a global power. We are the world's biggest market and we have to enforce our, val our values, human rights, democracy, when it comes to our trading partners. And Cecilia did a very good job when she was commissioner and we should continue on that path. Uh, no product should enter our market that is tainted by the suffering of people. Uh, if a country decides to uh, violate the rules of basic human rights, this uh, should have an implication on uh, what happens to their access to our European market. And also within our community, we have to raise certain basic freedoms to the level of the European community. We should not let uh, this to be dealt by only by the government because we see that every government uh, has a different standing. And uh, this is why it's such, so groundbreaking that uh, alongside Daniel, we managed to establish a rule of law mechanism within the EU that if put in use, has a chance to really uh, financially sanction those governments within the EU that violate uh, the rule of law and who act corruptly. Of course, we need to do much more, but really enforcement is the key and to be a confident power who is aware of our values and uh, who does not, uh, is not afraid of, uh, of making steps to enforce these values as well. And let me close by saying that the EU started off as a, a community of, uh, of business and this is fine, but we should stop being just as such. We have to be a global actor with values, policies, vision, and we have to develop those tools uh, that makes it possible for us to, uh, to, to make uh, these visions come alive and also to use the existing tools we have much better because this is a responsibility we Europeans bear, a global responsibility. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I'm sure our youth fellows, me, myself, all the audience really appreciates your uh, very passionate remarks on the things probably we could all agree with. Um, and let me now um, ask Daniel uh, for his comments. And uh, well, I would like to ask Daniel to perhaps share his thoughts um, about the political participation that our youth fellows have already presented. So especially they've referred to how to increase these underrepresented groups, how to equalize access to opportunities, particularly among those groups. And uh, we're very much looking forward to hear your comments on that. And also I'd like to take opportunity to have you on the panel today to ask you a bit about how you see this coming and happening to the uh, future, uh, to the conference and the future of Europe, because you're working on that. And I'm, I'm afraid we know very little about this conference other than that it's gonna happen, but uh, we don't know much. So please share with us some of your thoughts. Well, Florian, thanks, Daniel. Uh, for, for the invitation and thanks for, for all the inspiration uh, from, from all of you. I think, I mean, you, you, you started out uh, this session today with, with Greta and I have to say, I mean, not only do I think that I partly owe my current role as an MEP probably uh, to her because, you know, following the, the work of Fridays for Future, uh, the, uh, the election results of Green parties uh, all, all across Europe have um, skyrocketed, including my own party in Germany, and that has, has brought me to the European Parliament. So, but I, I think it, it also shows, you know, there, there's different ways of, of influencing politics. You know, going to the the election uh, and and participating in votes is 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 one way, but but obviously, uh, activism, uh, social movements, um, all all this contributes to to public debate and and it shapes politics. And I think what what Fridays for Future has done in such a short time frame, resetting the agenda in pretty much all of our member states right if you uh, if if you look at the polls that that the climate issue has now become the number one issue in in pretty much you know all european countries definitely and then in, in many countries beyond and and that even in a in a situation of global pandemic uh, the 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 issue has not vanished and it has remained there and i'm very happy that the european union um has has at least very much attempted to solve 
you know, not just the economic fallout of, of, of the Corona crisis, but to say that we take this opportunity as well to, to invest into our future, into uh, making our economies more sustainable and, and digitizing them. So I think, you know, all, all of that is the result of, um, of what um, a huge number of young people, including many that don't have the right to vote yet, uh, you know, because they're too young, um, have, have created that, that there was enough pressure, that there was enough public attention uh, on these issues. And I think it's hugely important uh, that, that that continues. Um, but, you know, as some of the speakers before have said, um, politics can particularly, you know, big shifts like making our economies green is not just something that we solve in one election or uh, through a couple of protests. This, this is a, a, a challenge at least for a generation, if not, if not two, right? Uh, it is sort of the plan is now over the next 30 years, uh, we're going to go to carbon neutrality uh, in, in Europe and hopefully by that example, bring the rest of the world along. And I think there it ties in with, with all the ideas that you have on the, um, on the UN 2.0. Um, I, I like the ambition. I, I fear uh, the obstructionism of, of, of many governments uh, on, on this planet, but I, I'm much more hopeful for an EU 2.0. And I think that's, that, that is what this conference on the future of Europe is about. Uh, I hope uh, very much that in, in the next few months, we have a great debate um, with with citizens, uh, with everyone that uh, wants to shape this this future. Um, what I have seen so far, the online platform that the Commission is putting forward, this seems promising. We as the European Parliament have fought very hard to have uh, randomly selected citizens assemblies at the heart of, of this process. So learning from the good examples that we have seen in Ireland, for example, uh, they have used this tool of randomly selected citizens assemblies that have ultimately led to the positive votes in the referenda on marriage equality uh, and, uh, and, and the right to abortion. And, and I think, um, you know, if we can pull that off at, at the European level, then I think that would be a fantastic outcome. Um, of, of this conference. And obviously, and, and that's something, you know, being now the only member of this executive board that's under 45, and, and even I already, I, I don't feel like a young person anymore, right? I'm, I'm 36, I'm, I'm quite old. Um, but, you know, being, being the youngest on, on this executive board, um, I, I, I think giving a special role to, you, to youth is, is, is absolutely vital because young people just have more future than, than older people. They're more concerned of what the EU looks like uh, in, in, in the future as well. And uh, well, hopefully all of you can, can support this because it's not going to be easy to, to fight for dedicated youth assemblies, for youth issues uh, to, to be center stage in this process. It, it needs some activism. It needs some pressure. It needs some, I don't know, emailing or phoning up uh, those people um, you know, on the sides of the, the governments of member states, uh, the commission as well, to, to make this happen. Because if, if you're not loud uh, about this, it's, it's too easy uh, to, to push it aside. And, and then we're back to, to that core problem that you identified, that young people are massively underrepresented in our political institutions, in our decision-making processes. And I would very much hope uh, that we can at least partially uh, correct that uh, for, for the conference. I'm very sorry that I basically have to, to leave you uh, like this now. Um, so if you have any questions to me, do send me an email or, or get in touch over social media uh, because unfortunately I have to go on to the next panel. But it was very nice meeting all of you and, and hearing these inspirational presentations. Thanks. Thank you so much, Daniel. No worries. Well, Daniel is very active indeed. So you can reach out to him many social media platforms. And uh, yeah, we wish you a good day. Thanks a lot for joining us, Daniel. <laughs> Um, thanks. Uh, well, with this, I think I will now collect some questions. Well, now what I can monitor in our Q&A session, it was very interactive and we are very efficient. Well, this is virtual possibility. Heather already took all the questions addressed to her. I lost even count, but she has replied. So many thanks, Heather, for <laughs> being that active and directly answering to the questions. But as some questions that I have to the panelists who will be recently speaking, maybe I will just, um, I will just uh, read them out loud. So we have the question for Cecilia. Talking about a country like North Korea, for instance, the UN doesn't have a favorable reputation among the people who suffered due to the regime. In terms of trust, what can those people expect? 
expect from those changes within UN? Uh, th thank you. you. Is the question related to tr the trust of the people of North Korea? Is that exactly, through the UN. So how, what could yeah. the UN do? Um... Well, that is a tricky one because, of course, the, the, the uh, opening of that country is not uh, very big. So they haven't really allowed for international organizations and international inspections or international um, bodies uh, to, to be, be present. Uh, so in North Korea, there is the problem of, of dictatorship. There is a problem of, of isolation and there is a problem of starvation. That, that is constant, but sometimes has, has huge peaks. Uh, so that is, of course, an, an area where the, the United Nations could help. But the problem is that, that the regime has not been very willing to let uh, outside help into the country. So, so that's a struggle. Um, I think that the most urgent uh, issue related to, to North Korea the coming month will probably be some sort of, of attempt by the US regime to uh, when it regards to the, the, the nuclear uh, weapon to see if there is any possibility to, to regulate this. As you know, or, or only this morning, they, they did new, um, uh, they, they sort of released new rockets from, from North Korea to, to remind the world that they still exist which I think it is a, a sign of. But, but it's very hard to help a country who doesn't want help. That, that's the short answer to this. Thank you so much, Cecilia. And I've been also like uh, reading the questions to youth fellows, but also it would be very good to hear the panel's feedback on that. So the two issues that I could spell out here, one is, um, well, how well the youth fellows have not uh, presented some strategies how to address the corporate tax avoidance and um, tax havens in Europe. So one thing, how could we address that? And the second thing, um, well, some of our audience, some of our listeners, followers, were expecting to see more on security and what EU could do on security and uh, to counter the threats. And here mentioning Russia, which shown its readiness to use military force to secure its interests. Well, Georgia, Ukraine, well, one of them is my country of origin. I could very closely relate. Uh, and so what you could do vis-a-vis uh, -vis neighbors for this military cooperation. Um, so maybe I let Kathleen and Cecilia uh, and also Heather, of course, uh, to split and uh, feel free to take the questions. Um. Um, so I think the question for, so these are extremely pressing, pressing questions and we should address them. Uh, first about taxes and tax avoidance and tax havens. This is also something that has to be done at a European level, because uh, if it is regulated country by country, uh, there will always be loopholes. And if like, let's say one country gets their taxes right, it will be basically punished by uh, companies fleeing from them to another country within the community who like give 0.1% uh, tax rate for for like a huge corporation. And we already have like some work in progress in the parliament about, um, or like with the intention of trying to create uh, a European level solution for, for, for tax havens and tax avoidance. Of course, there are extremely strong national lobbies there, but, uh, but this is why I, I would like to so encourage you guys as the voters of the future generation to push your politicians really hard that uh, there is popular demand for this regulation. Because of course we can have like a few politicians uh, who are up in for the good fight, but uh, really the lobbies are so strong, so extremely like powerful also here in Brussels and in the member states. So just as with the green issue, really the citizen's voice really has to be heard that we want a fair tax regulation in Europe. Um, security or shall I pass it pass on the floor or or, or like what's how, how should I move forward yeah, shall I also say something about the other point no please share your points and then maybe we'll pass that to other speakers if they would also like to address this question yes so security policy um well if uh, you might have noticed but I'm really a strong supporter of a more integrated Europe with more powers uh until we have that uh we, we indeed face certain challenges uh, in foreign policy and uh, it's really unacceptable or like impossible in, in this area where things change so fast and a quick reaction is so necessary 
the, the need, this constant need to mediate between 27 powers, 27 interests. We have a high representative who has very limited powers uh, and he is not even using his powers well enough. So I think what would be super essential to have is a treaty change and to get rid of the unanimity uh, in the council so that we could formulate a European policy better. Uh, I also strongly support what Cecilia said about uh, a joint EU seat in the Council so that we could have, as a community, a stronger say in what happens uh, in the world around us. But also the existing measures we have, the sanctions policy, for instance. Uh, I, I think we should be much more assertive uh, in, in using sanctions uh, against those who, who commit crimes against their population in the neighborhood. And lastly, trade. Like really, this is one of our most powerful weapon right now and more powerful instrument. So uh, we should also consider using uh, our trade means uh, in order to help to advance human rights uh, and, and also security issues in our neighborhood. But reform is it. Thank you so much, Catalin. As you're speaking, maybe I'll just give you another question because we got two more questions while you were speaking about the rule of law. So the one dimension is that, well, as we have backsliding of rule of law in the European Union, how does this affect the rule of law um, in, the, in its neighborhood, let's say in Serbia and Western Balkans? And then the other question, how should the EU make this more effective that actually the member states uh, st stick to the uh, rule of law enforcement? You know, this is such a crucial problem, uh, not only in the neighborhood, but in our like really a global affairs. I just talked to a colleague who was in touch with the Chinese ambassador and uh, about the Kai deal, they had a conversation. And my colleague brought up uh, the treatment of uh, Uyghurs and the Chinese human rights situation. And the Chinese ambassador replied that like, don't be such a hypocrite, just look at what happens to Poland and Hungary. And why at first, like, you know, take care of your own house before you do the finger pointing which is something that I completely not share. But this is, I think, a very, very visible uh, way on like how we can actually um, damage our reputation by just keeping silent about the issues that happens within our neighborhood. Uh, so the solution for that is twofold. First, yes, have and use the mechanisms we have in hand in order to create a union where every European citizen lives under um, the conditions of like basically European values that every country signed up for. We have to use the methods uh, such as the infringement procedures, the rule of law mechanisms, uh, and also to think about what other things we can do uh, in our power not to let democratic backsliding happen within, but also with our external uh, efforts, I, uh, when it comes to, for instance, enlargement, uh, what, uh, what you mentioned, uh, I, 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 I don't think actually that the EU, it's like an image problem for sure, but the EU is still a beacon of hope and freedom and democracy in the world. And it's not changing by, just by the fact that Mr. Orban is, is who he is. So we have to be active in our neighborhood, promote democracy, help activists, uh, uh, help the media, and also to create a pathway for these countries to access the EU, because this is like really a clear, clear way for them towards progress. But this path has to go through very, very clear measuring criteria. So we have to show to the world that EU membership comes with a clear condition, uh, and these conditions have to be obeyed until the country gets to membership and also afterwards. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I just very briefly uh, want to uh, ask Joshua Bloodworth, our youth fellow, because he wanted to briefly refer to this military cooperation and also tax havens, right, Joshua? Maybe you can very briefly uh, let us your comments on the asked questions. Hi, um, I think throughout the conference, the process, there was many, many ideas and many areas that we wanted to cover. And it was a very intense four day process. Um, so unfortunately, many things got left uh, at the drawing board and Urban was very much like, come on, keep pushing. What can we go streamline these ideas? So if you have any ideas that you'd think you'd really like to push forward to, I can just only say I encourage you to apply for the next conference. Um, with regard to tax, um, I do think the work empowerment should suggestion um, does provide a pathway to improving the corporation tax situation if 
employees of a corporation have more say within the running of that corporation, they are the ones, especially on those who are lower incomes, who are going to benefit most from proper tax collection and better public services, and therefore they can have an influence in making sure that those taxes are paid. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua, for this very brief, very informative response. I'm just afraid we are a bit running out of time. Um, so if you don't mind, let me just wrap up this session. I'm very happy to see so much interest in the International Youth Think Tank, so much interest in the SAPS Young Thinkers Initiative. I could see that in chats. There were many people asking about the links. Thanks a lot, Heather, for sharing with us the surveys you've mentioned, the reports you've mentioned. I'm sure it's, uh, it will give us even more food for thought. And um, thank you so much for all the speakers, despite their busy agendas, to be with us today. And many thanks to the audience who was following with us on Zoom, who was also watching us on SAP's YouTube channel. I just, um, we're just very much looking forward to receiving your application for the SAP's, um, SAP's Ideas Lab. Uh, and well, until then, I'm very much seeing and looking forward to welcoming you at other, at other events and SAP's Ideas Lab. Have a great afternoon. Goodbye.